So nothing can I bring, simple words alone, the phrases that I sing, my this worship song from a contrite heart, now reveal
Good morning, and God bless you all today. It's good to see you here as a, as a church family. It's good to be able to worship our Lord and Savior together in this place. As we get started this morning, I just want to, before we do our call to worship, before we sing together, just to put it out there. Um, this past week, we, as elders, we sent out an email communication. We recognize that not everybody's on the email list. Not everybody gets emails. I want to make you aware that we have made some changes in our guidances as a church in regard to COVID and uh, how we're handling, handling that. So you notice the windows are closed because it's cold out. And uh, as such, there's less ventilation. Uh, in our sanctuary. And so because of that, one of the ways that we want to keep ourselves uh, in, the, in the realm of safety and uh, to the best of our understanding and knowledge is we want to still be able to sing, but to do so safely and, and wisely, we want to uh, ask you all to continue to wear your masks while we sing um, so that we're not spreading things out that don't have places to go out the windows. You notice that those of us singing on stage will not have masks on, <laughs> but we are also keeping uh, these first couple of rows empty, with the exception of my wife, but you know, we live in the same house. Um, but also just so that we can keep, keep singing, keep safe, and keep warm this winter. That's kind of our threefold goal with that. And we do want to thank you all for the ways that you've been a part of helping and making sure that we're keeping with the guidances and being able to do the things that we need to do as a church family to keep meeting together safely during this time. You all have done a great job of being humble and wise and safe during this, and we're grateful to be part of this family. So with that, we're going to start this service off with Psalm 99, and as the people of God who live here on earth, we can become dismayed. Uh, at the pain that we experience and see. But the hope that we have is, is greater than life itself. So that we, we get to say with the psalmist, the Lord reigns, let the people tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he, the king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who were called, uh, who called upon his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statutes that he gave them. O Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord, our God, and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord, our God, is holy. So with that, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are good and loving and kind to us, and that you are holy above all things, and we get to worship you in the splendor of holiness, O Lord. Thank you for gathering us here and remotely to worship your name together today. Thank you for calling us by your name. Thank you for forgiving our sins against you by the power and by your blood shed on the cross. May you bring honor to your name today. May you bless the worship that we bring to you and bless the reading and the singing of your word today in your name. Amen. We invite you to stand and sing with us as we begin. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, the walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name.
be your name when the sun's shining down on me and the world's all as it should be blessed be your name blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering those pain in the offering blessed be your name Take away. Don't you? 
seated as Pastor Zach comes and dismisses kids and does our confession with us. Hey, good morning, church. It's wonderful to see you all here this morning. I'm glad you're with us. If you're with us online, we're glad you're here too. And if this is your first time with us online, uh, we want you to know a few quick things. One, this is a safe place for you to be if you're not sure what you think about God, Jesus, or the Bible. Uh, you are welcome here. This is a place for you to really kind of learn the basics of the Christian faith and what we believe, and we're glad that you are here with us. Uh, we are about to invite our kids to go to Kids Church, and before we do that, let's pray over you guys really quick. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for your love and grace and mercy, and we're thankful that as we gather, your word tells us uh, that you are here with us, that your presence is here with us, and I pray that we would enjoy that this morning, that you would work in our hearts and minds that you would draw us to a greater love for you and the mission to which you've called us. And right now, specifically, we thank you for the kids who are part of our church family, and that as they leave to Kids Church, that they would have fun, that they would hear the gospel, that they would have a better understanding of your story as revealed in the Bible, that they would come to know and love you and follow you all the days of their lives, that you would use them to do great and ordinary things for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I want to invite you kids, uh, those of you that are going, looks like Miss Elizabeth's in the back and Miss Grace is headed that way. You guys are welcome to do that. A few things to make you aware of, though, as we continue on with our service. One is where we are with our conversations on uh, changing the name of our church. And so if you want more information on how we came up with the name on which we're voting, which is next week, October 25th, right after the service for our members the name on which we're voting is Hope Community Church, um, and, and just so you know as well, we've sent letters out and ballots to our shut-ins um, so they can vote as well. Uh, we're guarding against ballot stuffing, whatever, All right, don't worry. But, um, you know, with the season we are in and, you know, if the federal government can do it, so can we. And so we've sent letters and ballots to our shut-ins because... You know, they're still important and have a voice, and their vote matters as well. And so that's happening. And then for the rest of us, the next Sunday, October 25th, right after service, we will be meeting for a, uh, a members meeting, and we will be voting on this name. And again, if you're curious on how this name is the name on which we came up with, there's a letter right here by the cross and uh, on the table, uh, and that explains everything. So thank you for being here and voting on that the last thing is uh, Trunk or Treat, October 31st, between 1 through 4. Thank you for all of you who have already signed up to decorate your car and bring candy. Thank you. Uh, if you can't be here, those of you that have brought candy in the basket, and if you want to be involved, you can uh, absolutely sign up in the back just so we know who all is going to be here. We've got some folks in uh, our community who are also doing some cars and stuff and are going to help us, so that's fun. And really, this is a way for us to engage our community, meet them where they are, grow in relationships with folks who live in our area to build relationships, hopefully redemptive relationships, as we point them to the hope we have in Jesus. And so hope you'll, hopefully you'll be a part of that. And then we're going to continue on with our service with our confession and assurance. And Martin Luther, I think, said it best when he said the Christian life is a life of repentance, meaning that as we follow the way of Jesus, we are continually and constantly reminded of our need and God's grace and His love and His mercy. 
Because every week, every day, we fall in some way, form, or fashion. We fall short of the glory of God. And so I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. You'll see the words behind me. For those of you online, you'll see the words under me. Let's pray. God of love, if it is your will that we should love you with our heart, soul, and mind, and strength. It is your will that we uh, love our neighbors as ourselves. But we continually fall short in these things. And we confess that our affections continually turn away from you. From trusting in you to trusting in ourselves. From compassion to indifference. From fullness to emptiness. From serving our neighbors to serving ourselves. Have mercy on us. Order our lives by your holy word and make your commandments the joy of our hearts. Conform us to the image of your loving Son, Jesus, that we may shine before the world to your glory. Amen. And the good news is that God has done everything we need to have a relationship with him, to find forgiveness and love, to be given a new identity, to understand our value. He did all of that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that whosoever believes the good news, that is, believes the gospel, has everlasting, genuine, and real life with the God of the universe, maker and sustainer of all things. In our brokenness and in our humility, we are given that through Jesus. This is our hope. This is why we gather. This is why we sing. And I want to invite you to respond to this good news with me by singing this next song. We do invite you to stand and continue in worship through song with us today. The wonder of your cross shall be our meditation. Holy 
Jesus, as we hear your word spoken, may we lay down our lives to understand you and know you better. And may this be for your glory. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as Pastor Zach comes and proclaims God's word to us today. So, uh, uh, you know, most people desire to live a, a happy and fulfilled life. I mean, if you think about it, like regardless of someone's political convictions or religious convictions, regardless of where they kind of are on their spiritual journey, regardless of if they're young or like in college and thinking about majors and what they want to do with their life, or whether they've retired and they've, you know, lived most of their life, most people have some same basic things in common. And I think two of those things are most people want to live a happy and fulfilled life. I mean, think about it. I've never met someone that said, man, I really hope that I can live a very unhappy and unfulfilled life. Like, that would be sick. Uh, and, and the reality is you've probably never heard someone say that either because most people want this. And for the next, well, four-week series, last two weeks and the next two weeks, you know, we're talking about the mission of Jesus. And here's what I think. I really believe that as we individually are becoming who God created us to be, we'll find fulfillment and a happiness that can't be found otherwise. And, and I don't mean to say that if you follow Jesus, your life will be happy without pain or tears or trauma or any of that. Jesus tells us that uh, we will expect as we follow him trials and tribulations, and, and that's part of the journey, but I do think as we follow the way of Jesus, join to the mission of Jesus, there's, there's fulfillment found in living this way, living the way of Jesus, that's not, found, that's not fulfilled in any other way. And Jesus tells us when he came, and, and he gives us as the church this kind of uh, imperative, this command to go and make disciples. And the way we look at discipleship is really becoming who God created you to be. Uh, and Jesus really, I think, gives us a great little sentence of insight on what that actually looks like in Matthew 4.18, where Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so Jesus is giving us a command to radically reorient our lives around the person of Jesus and the work that Jesus is doing. And I really believe that when we radically reorient our lives around the person work of Jesus, there is a happiness and fulfillment that can't be found anywhere else. And so really this series that we're calling the mission of Jesus is more so about how we as a church are collectively trying to make disciples, to, to help people find and follow Jesus, be transformed by Jesus, and join the mission of Jesus, which is really this 
what I think this little sentence boils down to. As Jesus is calling his first disciples, as well as us and people everywhere, people in our community, to follow him, to radically reorient their lives around him. And that he will make, right, that there's genuine life transformation as we follow the way of Jesus. Jesus says, follow me and I will make you into fishers of men. That we're radically transformed into something that we once were not. And we're joining Jesus on his mission to help people find and follow him be transformed by him, and join to his mission. And as we think about making disciples and how we as a church want to, to make disciples and, and how every person that's following Jesus is called to be a disciple maker, so how are we collectively doing this? And that's really kind of what this series is about. How is our church, our church family, coming together to help people become who God created them to be. And so we've really been thinking about this in kind of four different levels or four different stages which these chairs represent. And when we look at the Bible, I think we see areas where people are growing continually as they are a mature disciple of Jesus or mature follower of Jesus. Right? The first chair we've been talking about Uh, we've talked about is how people ought to, and we ought to, and you ought to, in order to become who God created you to be, you need to be growing with God, right? That's uh, understanding the gospel and growing in that. That's understanding what the Bible says and applying our lives to that. And obviously, there are personal spiritual rhythms in each of our lives that will help us grow in our relationship with God. And for us as a church, as we think about making disciples and helping people find and follow Jesus, be transformed by Jesus, and join the mission of Jesus, this chair really represents our Sunday morning worship gatherings, where people who aren't sure what they think about Jesus, God, or the Bible, your friends, families, and neighbors who are spiritually curious and want to know more about the Christian faith, this is a safe space for them to be and hear the gospel preached. Whether you're a follower of Jesus for 60, 70 years, this is where we collectively come and grow in our dependence on God, where we're seeing what the Bible has to say, and we are, as a community, learning to apply our lives to that truth. We want to be a church that helps people grow with God. And then last week we talked about the next chair, kind of the next step. We want to be a church that helps people grow in their relationship with others. You know, the Bible talks about how church families, we ought to be there for each other, praying for each other, encouraging one another, uh, sharing one another's burdens, weeping with one another when there's pain, rejoicing with one another when there's happiness. And kind of our avenue for that is small groups. And yesterday my small group met over Zoom and, you know, we got to pray for a family that's not here this morning, um, a, a man and you know their kid at school was around an adult with tested positive for COVID, so they're like on lockdown for two weeks. And like getting to go with that, go through that with him and praying for him. Another guy in my small group there in Massachusetts this weekend for a funeral this morning and praying uh, that the gospel would go out. And because uh, most of the people in his family aren't, you know, they don't know and love. Jesus, and really to be there with one another and encourage one another. And then these next two chairs uh, are kind of joining the mission of Jesus. And so here's how why I've kind of got them split. So last week and the week before, we talked about growing with God, growing with others. And, and, the way, and I'm a very simple-minded person. I like things to be broken down very easily and, and simply. That's how I work. And so I want us to think about to find and follow Jesus and be transformed by Jesus primarily for us, happens this way. Find and follow Jesus, Sunday morning worship experience. Be transformed by Jesus, where we're transformed by God's Holy Spirit, God's Word, and God's people. Happens in small groups. And these next two chairs really represent what it looks like for us as a church to join the mission of Jesus, where we learn to serve with purpose, is what we're talking about here shortly. And the next week we're going to talk about engaging your world, and that you are a disciple maker, and that we as a church want to be a disciple making church, join to the mission of Jesus, but also that you as an individual, God has you where you are in your family, in your neighborhood. I'm jumping ahead to next week. I'm going to stop myself right there. And let's jump into the Bible. Before we do, we're going to be in Ephesians uh, starting out, and then we're going to jump over to 1 Corinthians. If you want to turn there or flip there to one of those books, It will be on the screen behind me. If you're watching online, it will be under me. And before we open up the Bible, though, let's just take a brief moment to pray. 
So, Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for your love and grace and mercy. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. Lord, you are good and true. And right now, specifically, God, we thank you for uh, the Bible and that as we open it, we really believe that by the power of your Spirit, you are speaking through it to us. And I ask that we as a community would, would receive it with, with a joyful and glad heart, rejoicing in the fact that you're speaking to us, that you, you desire to change us and mold us and to transform us into something better and that we are here. Lord, for you to have your way in us. And I pray that we would be receptive to uh, your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And so the first letter, the first little passage we're going to be in, we talked briefly about last week. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. And so Paul's writing this letter to the church at Ephesus. And it's a, it's a short letter, but it is packed full of great, deep theological truth about who God is, and specifically like what the church is and what it looks like. And here's what he says in verse 11. And he gave, that is God or Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the triune God, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Or, to, to put briefly, he gave kind of this o overarching kind of church leadership in these local churches. So teachers, evangelists, these types of things. Church leadership. For what reason? He tells us in verse 12. To equip the saints for the work. And so saints is believers. It's followers of Jesus. Saints is actually, um, in the Greek which the New Testament was written in, it's the, the plural version of the word holies. And so it's pretty much like what the God transforms us when we place our faith in Christ. We are fundamentally transformed into something other, separate, and we're called saints, holies, followers of Jesus. So church leadership is given to local churches for the followers of Jesus to be equipped for what purpose? For the work of ministry. For building up the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. And maybe you didn't really grow up in church. Um, and so when I say, I, and again, I'm a simple person. When, when, I, like to, when I read this, what I, what I see here is church leadership are really to function kind of as coaches for the members of a church. Those who collectively gather. Remember, church comes from the Greek word ekklesia. It literally means gathering. So before the New Testament was written, that word was used almost in like for political conventions. It's a, a gathering of people coming together for a purpose. And the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of these letters in the New Testament, kind of steals this word and adds new meaning to it. And, and so now church is this gathering of people who are coming together in localized communities to do something. They're gathering for a purpose. And as they're gathering, we're told that leadership is to kind of function like a coach to help those who gather become who God created them to be. To, that they would be equipped for the work of ministry. Now, I grew up in a smaller church in the South, and when I think of uh, how I always viewed the church was that the pastor or associate pastor, those are the guys who do the work of ministry. And I'm the one to whom they do ministry to. And maybe you grew up in a, a smaller church setting or a church setting, and that's kind of your backdrop too. When you think of that, you think of the pastor or elders or deacons, whatever you guys called them in your church growing up, those are the ministers, right? We even use those terms, the ministers. They do the work of the ministry, and as I'm a member of this church, I am the one to whom they minister. And Paul's saying that's not actually an accurate view of what the purpose should be. And he's saying that church leadership is a good gift to local churches to help believers, followers of Jesus, actually be equipped to do the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ. And so here's kind of what I want us all to really uh, think about as we get into our next passage, and it's this, that we all have work to do. 
that every one of us, as, as you regularly attend a local church, and I know we've got some folks online um, who um, actually I texted with one this week and not really in a church and doesn't live anywhere in the area. I really want to encourage you also to plug into a local church because God has something for you to do as well. It's about us coming together to join the mission of Jesus. We have work to do in the community, but also work to do with one another. Building up the body of Christ, as Paul tells us in Ephesians. And remember, the church is very literally and very uh, really, it is this. It is the physical representation of Jesus to the world. And so for us, that means our local church, our gathering of believers, is the physical representation of Jesus to the greater Portland area. And we all have work to do to build up this body. And so the next letter I want us to flip over to is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to start in verse 14. And again, this is a letter that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And it's this... Um, it's a really nice letter. This church had lots of issues and lots of problems. And so what we get is really a really well done kind of church manual on how local churches should and should not operate. Like there are things we should be doing and things we shouldn't be doing. And then as part of this letter, Paul says this as he's talking about the local church in Corinth. He says this, for the body, remember the body of Christ, the physical representation of Jesus, that is the church, the body just like our human bodies, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? Um, like, this makes sense to us, right? Like, as we think of the physiological makeup of our human bodies, we understand that it takes lots of different parts and pieces that do different things, that look differently, uh, coming together for a purpose. And Paul's using the same image as he's talking about a local church. That we all may look different, have different backgrounds, different past experiences, different passions, different gifts. But as we come together to be the healthiest version that we can be, it takes all of us doing our part in the body. And that may sound overly obvious, but how often do we think like that, right? We think that it's just one person or these few people. They're doing the work and, and we're just those to whom ministry is being done to. And Paul's saying, no, it takes all of us coming together and doing our part. And yes, we are different. And yes, we have different personalities and different gifts. And that's a good thing. And I know I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. How true is it? Could you imagine how terrifying our church would be if every one of us had my personality, gifts, and talents? It'd be scary. How terrifying would our church be if every one of us had the same personality makeup as you, with your same gifts and talents, right? Like, if, if our church consisted of each one of us, the same each one of 50 versions of each one of us, like we would die quickly, right? It's a, it's, so it's good. It's this beautiful picture that we all have a part, that we all may be different, but when we come together joining the mission of Jesus, like God's advancing His kingdom here on earth through us and all of our, I would say glory, but that's probably definitely the wrong word. But He uses us instead as we come together. And then He says this, God arranged the members in the body each one of them as he chose. Like, you're not here by accident. God has a place for you in this church body as our family. And then if you jump over to verse 7 and verse 12, we see this, that to each person is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And so as we're thinking about this morning and as we're thinking about kind of serving with purpose, I want us to think about the common good being our local church. 
And then next week we're going to talk about how we serve our community. But, but for this morning, as we think through serving with purpose, I want us to think through using our gifts, talents, and abilities for our church body to be a healthy, functioning body, the healthiest version of us that we can be. And any of you that have ever dealt with severe illness or, you know, things going wrong in your body, you know how important it is for every body part to function properly, right? Like when I was 14, my my grandmother had a severe stroke, and for like the last 10 years of her life, she couldn't walk, she couldn't use her right arm, she couldn't talk, she pretty much just sat in a chair or in a wheelchair. And as you're confronted with this, you just you're confronted with the reality that like, as you're confronted with thinking through the way our body works and how the Apostle Paul is equating how our body works to how a local church body works, we have to understand that for us to be the healthiest we can be, it takes all of our parts, meaning all of our members, meaning each one of us coming together and doing our bit as we join the mission of Jesus, to build up this church, to be the physical representation of Jesus to the world. So the first thing I want us to think through this morning is this. I want you to know your part. I mean, this is what Paul is saying, that we all have a part, that the ear can't say to the hand, um, you're, not, you're useless, and the foot needs to be a foot, and the eye needs to be an eye, that the body needs all of these things to function well and properly and be healthy. I want you to know your part and where you fit in this local body. And I know the first question many of you have is, well, how do I know that, right? Because I also know that many of you, as we think through the fact and the reality that we're a smaller church, like we've got a lot of great volunteers. This needs to be done, I'll do it. And I'm going to do it, and we get burned out because I'm doing this because it needs to be done, not because I'm finding fulfillment and purpose in serving this way. I'm not necessarily using my gifts and talents in the way God created me. And like that's good and useful. And we, wanna, we want, though, for each of us to really know our part and serve where God has gifted us and with our passion so we don't burn out as quick. We're, we're building in rhythms to where we're, we're enjoying our service as worship and not just because, you know, we love our church and this has to be done so I'm going to do it. Sometimes that has to happen. But if this is how it always functions, if we're all just doing what has to be done because it needs to be done and we're all burned out, we're not going to be as healthy as we can be, Right? And so I want you to actually know your part and know where you fit. So how do we do that? The first thing, and I came up with these. This is not any great biblical revelation. But from what I see in the Bible, these are my three observations on how you can know your part. One is to pray, right? Obvious church answer. The Lord knows you more and better than anyone else does, better than yourself. And so pray, like, well, where do I fit? Like, God created you for a purpose. And Paul tells us that he gives you certain gifts and talents and, and passions, gifts of his spirit, that as you follow the way of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit working inside of you, and he has given you a gift to build up the church. Right? And so pray. The next thing I want you to do is ask someone who's close with you, like someone that knows you, that cares for you, that loves you, like, hey, where do you see, what kind of gifts do you see in me? Where do you see me succeeding? Like, because I really feel like I'd be good at kids ministry. And the three people that you ask may be like, oh gosh, no, don't do that to those kids. But they may, they may affirm it and be like, oh yeah, I could see that. That'd be awesome. And so ask. Ask people that love you and care about you and want you to succeed in following Jesus well. And the third thing is this. Try something. Try something. And, and I, I know that most of us, most of our greatest fears, I know my greatest fear is the fear of failure. I don't like to fail. I don't like to be bad at stuff. And growing up, uh, my sister and I were very different. I did a few things that I could do well, and I did those things. So, like, I played hockey, and I played soccer, and that was about the most I did. Because I was terrified of failure. If I knew I was good at something, I would do it, and I would go all in. And my sister, on the other hand, did everything. I mean, she would try something and either be horrible at it or be good at it, and then she would try something else and then try something, and she's still that way. It drives me nuts. 
She's always trying new things. And I feel like most of us probably fit into my camp, though, as we think about trying to serve and build up our church. Well, if I try this and I hate it or I'm not good at it, that's bad. Can, and I want everyone to hear this. Failure is not fatal. Failure is not fatal. Step out of your comfort zone and try something. That's okay. And if it doesn't work out, hey, it doesn't work out. We all learn from things and we move on to the next thing. Failure is not fatal. But not only do I want you to know your part, I want you to play your part. Because the truth is this, knowledge without action is pointless. Knowledge without action is useless. So many of you know that um, we have two sons, and our, both of our boys are wild, to say the least. And, and Josiah, though, has found something that he loves and is really good at, the Ninja Warrior Gym. They do, yeah. They do classes, main Ninja Warrior Gym, and he's been taking these classes, and he loves it because it's all about climbing stuff that you're usually not supposed to climb and jumping off of tall things that you're usually not supposed to jump off of and jumping from this to this, and he loves it, and he's good at it because those of you that see him running around, like he's fearless, he loves to climb things that you're not supposed to climb. Like it's terrifying as a parent, but he's great at it. And the other day I walked in the house, and, and he knows something. He knows something. Um, he knows that the world is not his Ninja Warrior gym. That there's the Ninja Warrior gym where we do Ninja Warrior stuff, and there's our house where you don't do Ninja Warrior stuff, right? And he knows this, and I walked in, and he's practicing his precision jumps where you, you know, two feet, and you jump, and you land on two feet on the arms of the couches. One, I was impressed that he could do it. Two, uh, so I walk in, and he's practicing his precision, and he jumps, and he lands, and he jumps to the next couch. I'm like, Josiah, what are you doing? Our house is not, and he stops me, and he goes, I know, Dad, it's not my ninja warrior gym. You see, he knows, but he's not acting like he knows. Therefore, his knowledge is completely pointless. It doesn't matter that he knows. Right? And so, and as we think about that, even with our gifts and talents, like, I, I don't want you just to know where you fit in, the, in our local body. I want you to function in that because knowledge without action is useless. And so I want you to know your part and play your part well. Because here's the reality in order to become who God created you to be, I really believe you need to serve with purpose. I believe you need to serve with purpose. That you need to know how God created you, why God created you, because He did. Paul tells us in another, or in the same letter to the uh, church at Ephesus, that God created you like beforehand with good works in mind, good things for you to do, that God has a plan and purpose for your life. And part of your identity is absolutely wrapped up in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. But part of your identity is also wrapped up in the fact that God created you to join the mission of Jesus. And I know we all have different life stories and different pasts and different um, worldviews to a certain degree. But that doesn't negate the fact that God has a purpose for your life. And I want you to know that and function in that. I love these verses in Philippians, another letter that the Apostle Paul wrote in chapter 2, in verse 3 through 8. As we think about doing our part, we all have work to do. I want us to know our part and play our part. The Apostle Paul wrote this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with him, uh, equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but instead he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know, as we follow the way of Jesus and join the mission of Jesus, we're confronted with the fact that we serve others. We're called to serve others. We're called to serve each other. 
And so, yes, we want you to grow with God and grow with others and serve with purpose. But here's also what this means. This doesn't mean that everyone that comes on a Sunday morning should be in this chair yet. And here's why. I want you to think, as we think through our disciple-making process as a church, if I bring someone who I'm close with, maybe I've got to share the gospel with him, and he's a new believer, he may need to just be in these two chairs at first, and that's okay. There are people in my life that are, um, whom I love and care for, and they're really broken. I know we're all broken, but you know, I mean, they're really broken, and they're, they're, they need healing. And they need to really grow in their relationship with God and their relationship with others to find healing, right? And so we're not saying that if you're not to this, if you're not ready to step to this chair, um, you're not there. The following the way of Jesus is a lifelong journey. And some of us may just be in this chair. And that's okay. We want you to move to the next chair. Some of you may be in these two chairs and you're ready to serve with purpose and we want you to move to this chair. But just because somebody may be in chair one or chair two or chair three or even all four chairs, it doesn't make them any more or any less than anyone else. Right? Following Jesus is a lifelong process. And so what I mean to say is this, that to become who God created, a mature disciple of Jesus, someone who's being used by Jesus to make more disciples, typically, from what I see in the New Testament, is growing in their relationship with God. They're growing in their relationship with others. They're serving with purpose, and they're engaging their world. And so here's really what we want you to do with this information this morning. Those of you that are ready to serve with purpose, and I know many of you are. I think I did a count, and like almost 80% of the people we have in small groups are on some version of a serve team. And so I know many of you are, and if you're not, that's okay. But we want you to know your part and play your part. And so here's kind of how we're handling this now. We are, we've got four serve teams um, that we're really emphasizing. And so a serve team is pretty much our orga- organizational effort to get people uh, serving and building up the body where to really guard against burnout, where somebody doesn't feel like they have to do the same thing until they die, right? Because we've all been there too. We'd, some of you are there. Like you signed up for something 22 years ago and no one said you can stop. And so we're, we're trying to just organize to, to guard against burnout. Um, and also we're really trying to organize because right now our church is small, right? I don't have to point that out to most of us. And the reality is we just don't have a whole lot of volunteer base. And so what we're doing is trying to concentrate on four main areas that's going to help us with this first chair for now, if that makes sense. And so right now our four teams really revolve around this first chair that we have organizationally speaking. So we have uh, music and audiovisual. So if you're interested in playing an instrument or singing or learning how to do the tech stuff or we have an awesome cameraman up there right now, the man, myth, the legend, the greatest cam- yeah, greatest cameraman in the world. Um, so if you're interested in doing that to help our church, so that's a team you can, you can uh, sign up for. There's sign-up sheets in the back. If you're interested in cleaning, um, Gary, many of you know Gary was our janitor for a long time, and he and Callie have both been told by their doctor that they're not allowed to get COVID. So they've been staying at the house, been worshiping with us online, And then so some other of his health things, he's had to kind of step down from being a janitor. And we really don't have the funds right now to pay for another janitor. So we've got some different families and people who are signed up to, I mean, this is a massive church facility and building, right, Um, for a church of 50 people. And and so to clean, like maybe you're like, okay, I'm, I'm just a server, like I find uh, my passion, I find fulfillment in just serving when nobody can see me, where I can just show up and work for the glory of God. Like, that's what I, I like. Maybe that's something you can do. Um, I'll never forget, one, un, a man by the name of John Hughes at the last church we were at taught me what it meant to really worship God through serving when nobody was looking. And so our last church, 
did uh, a wanted program and stuff, and we did bu buses and vans for kids, and they would do a meal for, I don't know, 150-something people. And John Hughes would show up every Tuesday. So Awana and stuff was on Wednesday night, and he would set up the chairs and the tables. But he would not just throw them up to leave, like, you know, I'm get this, i got to get this done. Uh, to watch him set up these chairs and tables, because I helped him a few times, and he really taught me what it's like to worship God through service, and they would be just right, because this is for the glory of God. And he would set up these chairs, and he would think through, like, the flow of the room as a complete act of worship and bringing glory and honor to God. He's playing his part, and it was beautiful. And he taught me so much about what it means to worship through just serving when nobody can see you as we play our part. So maybe that's you. Maybe, you know, you, God has given you this passion. Like, if we're not reaching the next generation, if we're not reaching kids, like, we're hopeless. Maybe you need to think about uh, what it looks like to join the kids' ministry team. And that's kind of the longest process as far as having to be here for a certain amount of time and application and background checks because we value our kids, right? And so we value those who are working with our kids. But maybe you're interested in what that looks like. Sign up for that. And then we're also starting a new team as we think about just uh, this, this chair and our church doing it well, the greeting team. And those of you that know Joel, I know that he's very outgoing, um, and friendly, and he has agreed to kind of head this team up, and it's pretty much people to welcome folks in, whether they're new, to help them find what they need to know, to get where they need to get, to really just be a welcoming face, to greet them in, to make people feel welcome in God's house, because we do, part of our vision statement is to be a safe and compassionate place, and we, and we really think that's kind of the front lines of people feeling welcomed, like they belong, and maybe you're interested in that, sign up. But I also want to mention this. I know that some of you, um, and I've had conversations with some folks, maybe you're, you're older in life and stuff, and, and you really are upset, not upset, but you're struggling with the fact that I used to be able to do so much, and now I can't. Physically or whatever, I can't. Like, I, I've, been, I've done so much for so long, I really don't know what... I can do, I'm definitely not going to clean because my back is given out or we're stuck worshiping at home. Like, where is my place? And can I just tell you this? The most important thing any of us can do as we are members of our body is to pray regularly and routinely for our church to become what God wants it to be. That we would reach our community with the gospel. That we would take the hope we have in Jesus to the world. And nothing we do means anything without prayer and unless the Lord himself is in it. And so don't look at, well, all I can do is pray. Oh, no. Pray fervently. Pray well. Uh, make it, set up a regular routine time to just pray for our church family. And know that that's not just praying. That is vital to our church becoming healthy and what God created it to be. Like, and you don't have to feel bad if you can't do one of these four things. Or you, you don't have to feel bad because you can't do one of these four things for other reasons. We're really just doing these four because we're a church of 50 people and we've got to be really um, practical about where we're trying to set up teams for right now. And as we grow, and I know many of you, actually I don't know that any of you in our church don't want our church to grow. Um, we can add teams to that. And so really, I just want to encourage you to serve with purpose. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you, and we thank you for your love and grace and mercy. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. God, you are good and true, and we are so thankful. Uh, we are so thankful that you use ordinary and average and broken individuals for your glory. That you have a part for all of us to play as we build one another up to be the hands and feet of your son Jesus, that we would be the physical representation of your son to the world, and we would do that well. And I pray that we would find fulfillment in serving, that we would worship you well in serving you, and that you would be honored and glorified in this. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. As we begin to, uh, as we sing again, I invite you to stand and sing with us. And uh, we, we get to rejoice in the fact that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is there with us as we serve and worship him together.
He is worthy of all of our praise. Amen. Does the Father truly love us? Does the Spirit move among us? And us, Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves. He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people. He has made us a kingdom and praise to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy?
Heavenly Father, you are worthy. You are worthy of our love. You are worthy of our affections. And you are worthy of our service. And I pray that we would worship you well. That we would become who you created us to be. I pray that you would bless every person in here this morning, Lord, that as they leave, they would love you well, serve their neighbors well. We pray that your will would be done here in the Great Lord Portland area, just as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You are dismissed. If you want to give, please feel free to do so in the box. Um, we'll see you next time.